I wish I could tell you that the science says that Omicron only causes mild symptoms, but alas, that's not what the science says. Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and just out of shop now is my assistant, Julie Oliver. In my previous video about Omicron, I mentioned that there were some reports suggesting that Omicron may cause milder disease, but it was too soon to tell. Well, it's still too soon to tell. And in this video, I will be explaining why the current data being reported may be misleading. I will also explain why a commonly held belief that viruses mutate to be less lethal and cause milder disease is actually a fallacy. But don't worry, we will be finishing on a positive note and looking at the latest science, which suggests that being vaccinated will still help prevent serious disease and death. But first, I'd like to clear up something regarding the pronunciation of Omicron. Some people pronounce it Omicron like I do, whereas some people are pronouncing it Omicron. Now, it doesn't really matter, except I've heard some people pronouncing it Omicron, claiming they are right, and the people pronouncing it Omicron are wrong. Well, as you know, Omicron is a Greek letter, so let's ask my Greek friend how it should be pronounced. Omicron. So there you have it, straight from the Greek guy's mouth. The correct pronunciation is Omicron. Now let's go back to the science and look at why variants occur. One of the most important things to know about viruses is that they don't have brains. They don't think. Every change they make is random. Viruses can only replicate by hijacking cells and convincing them to make copies of themselves. However, they are not perfect at doing this, so they make mistakes. And these mistakes lead to changes in the virus. Sometimes these changes will be detrimental and the virus particle produced will not be able to further infect cells. Sometimes the changes won't make any real difference. But sometimes the changes will give the virus a fitness advantage, which allows it to take over from other variants. Now, there are a number of different things that can lead to a fitness advantage. It could be better at evading immune responses, and this is not necessarily antibodies, it could be innate immune responses. It could grow to a higher viral load and therefore more virus will be available to infect others. It could be more stable outside the body. It could have a shorter incubation period, making contract tracing harder. We saw this in Sydney with the Delta variant. Prior to Delta, our contact tracing system meant that close contacts of traces could be identified and isolated before they became contagious. With Delta, by the time people were identified, it was already too late. Another change that could give it a fitness advantage would be the ability to enter cells more easily. And as we discussed in our previous Omicron video, it appears that some of the mutations in Omicron will help to do this. Finally, a virus could become more fit if it could replicate for longer without making the host very sick. And it is this possibility that has led to the misconception that viruses always evolve to become less virulent. Now, there are some examples of viruses evolving to become less virulent. One was a virus introduced into Australia to control the rabbit population. It originally killed the rabbits, but that is no longer the case. However, this doesn't always happen with viruses. Smallpox, for instance, maintained its high mortality rate until it was eradicated. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it is most contagious at early stages of the disease, typically a couple of days before to a couple of days after symptom onset. This means there is no advantage to the virus to evolve to become less virulent because it already spreads well before it causes serious disease or death. And this is one of the reasons SARS-CoV-2 led to a pandemic, whereas SARS-CoV-1 didn't. In the case of SARS-CoV-1, Patients were most contagious when they already had serious disease, so the opportunities for spread were much lower. Now, SARS-CoV-2 could still become less virulent by coincidence if mutations that gave it a fitness advantage also just happened to reduce its virulence, but there is no selective pressure for this to occur. This figure shows the number of people requiring hospitalisation for COVID in South Africa over time, as well as the level of care they require. And at first glance, it looks like Susan is wrong and Omicron definitely causes milder disease than Delta. 
Although hospitalizations are on the increase, the proportion requiring ICU treatment or oxygenation is still quite low. However, looking at the raw data like this doesn't tell the full story. Firstly, it takes a while to develop serious disease, so we can't know yet what proportion of people will ultimately require ICU care or oxygenation. Secondly, this data hides the fact that it is believed that 75 to 80% of the population of South Africa has already been infected in previous waves of COVID. And this means most people in South Africa are getting Omicron after being previously infected. So one of the reasons they are getting a milder disease is because they have some protection against serious disease from their immune response to their previous infection. But of course, if you have never been infected before and you haven't been vaccinated, there is no evidence that you will be as lucky. Okay, so that's enough of me being a wet blanket. Let's look at the evidence suggesting that you should still have protection against serious disease if you are double vaccinated and protection against symptomatic disease if you have been boosted. A number of research groups have now done antibody neutralization assays, comparing the ability of antibodies from various sources to neutralize the Omicron virus compared with previous viruses. This is an in vitro technique, so it's not directly relevant to what happens in humans, but it gives us an idea. Now, I hear people in the media all the time saying that in vitro means it was done in a petri dish. It actually doesn't mean that, it means it was done in a lab. It could have been done in a petri dish, but more likely it would have been done in what is known as a well plate. And this is an example of a 96 well plate. It's probably not that clear really. I don't know if I can, no, no, you really can't see it very well. But maybe if I take the lid off, hmm. oh yeah, maybe it's a little bit better. Um, so this has 96 wells and they're all in this one sort of plastic plate. And you can also get well plates with a smaller number of larger wells and also larger plates that have lots and lots of wells. And the reason these plates are used is because you actually need to do a large number of separate experiments to get your answers in in vitro testing and using well plates saves time and money. Now, in an antibody neutralization assay, you test different concentrations of antibodies to see how much is needed to prevent 50% of cells being infected. At the time I'm recording this video, there have been six different research groups that I know of who have done neutralization assays for Omicron. And by the time you're watching the video, there will probably be more. I won't take you through all of the findings, but these are the highlights. Firstly, there is a between 7 and 41 fold reduction in neutralizing antibodies compared with the wild type virus in serum from those who have had two doses of Pfizer. Significant reductions in neutralizing antibodies are also seen in sera from those previously infected and those who have had two doses of AstraZeneca or Moderna. So that's the not so good news. Now for the good news. Sera from those who have had a booster shot of Pfizer had similar levels of neutralizing antibodies against Omicron as seen against the wild type virus after two doses. Similarly, one vaccine dose after infection also substantially improved neutralizing antibody levels. And interestingly, one AstraZeneca dose followed by a Pfizer dose was more effective than two doses of either. And this is consistent with a study we discussed in the booster dose video. So check it out if you'd like to know more. And the in vitro data is consistent with some early real world data coming out of the UK. The graph on the left compares the vaccine effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine against the Omicron variant, which is shown as circles, and the Delta variant shown as squares. And the graph on the right shows the same for the Pfizer vaccine. There isn't really enough data yet, but it looks like there is a substantial drop in vaccine effectiveness for both. However, if you get a booster dose to Pfizer after either vaccine, the vaccine effectiveness increases to about 75%. And that's the data with the pink boxes around it. So this is good news if you've had your booster shot, but if you haven't, you might be feeling a bit flat right now. However, it is important to remember that although you may have limited protection against symptomatic infection with Omicron, there is evidence that you are still protected against serious disease and death. And the reason for this is your B cells and T cells. And you can learn more about these in our booster dose video. Although there are reduced neutralizing antibodies against the Omicron variant, they are not reduced to zero. 
It's important to know that when you form antibodies to the spike protein, you don't just form one type of antibody. You form different antibodies to different parts of the spike. And the parts of the spike that antibodies are made for are known as epitopes. So although some epitopes may change, you will still have antibodies to the epitopes that haven't changed. And this means within a few days, your memory B cells will kick in and start making more of the antibodies that are effective. This may be too late to stop infection, but it won't be too late to stop serious disease. The other good news for those already vaccinated is T cells. CD8 T cells, which are also known as killer T cells, are able to recognize cells that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 and destroy them before they can make any more virus. They recognize different epitopes on the spike protein than antibodies, and as shown in this graph, 86% of these epitopes are preserved in Omicron. So we still have T cell protection against serious disease from Omicron. Finally, I'd like to finish with some interesting information about Omicron from Sydney, Australia. Now, this is anecdotal, not science, but it shows how Omicron is not necessarily the explanation for increasing cases. So we have been seeing quite an increase in cases of COVID over the last week. And although this corresponds to the arrival of Omicron in Sydney, it is not the cause because only 55 of the cases are actually Omicron. And we do genomic sequencing on all cases. The reason we are seeing an increase in cases is a combination of it being the silly season, which means lots of people out partying, and the fact that we've been having some pretty atrocious weather. We've been having lots of wind and rain and the temperatures have been freezing. And when I say freezing, I mean Sydney freezing, which means temperatures below about 20 degrees Celsius. Anyway, the weather means people are partying indoors instead of outdoors. So when apportioning blame for increasing cases, you need to take into account behaviour changes and other confounding factors and not just assume it's all related to a new variant. One of the places that some spread of COVID occurred was on this harbour cruise. As you can see, there are lots of people jam-packed like sardines, breathing heavily and moving around, and they were together for three and a half hours. After the cruise, five people tested positive for COVID and two of those had Omicron and the other three Delta. It is now nine days since the cruise was held and 11 people have now tested positive and three of those have been confirmed to be Omicron. But some genomic sequencing is still pending, so a few more could also be Omicron. The total number of people on the cruise, though, was about 140. So less than 10% of people have been infected. And I should mention that everyone on the cruise would have been double vaccinated, but not boosted. Of course, we don't have a non-vaccinated person's cruise to compare numbers with, but it certainly appears that vaccinated people hanging out with other vaccinated people still help stop transmission. So in summary, if you've been vaccinated or previously infected, infection with Omicron will likely be mild. But there is no evidence that infection will be mild if your immune system is naive. If you would like to look further into the data that I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember, this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.